Welcome to the Institute for Government. Um, I'm Jill Rutter. I'm a Programme Director for our Better Policy Making Programme at the Institute for Government. Uh, to those of you that are serial recidivists here, welcome again. For those of you that haven't been here before, where have you been? And make sure we can stay in touch with you. Um, in April, we launched a report called Making Policy Better, and another report available only online and therefore in this flimsy format called System Stewardship, which looks at the future of policy making and says basically if policy making is going to work in the future, it needs to be seen not as a sort of one shot, one hit uh, intervention, but as an adaptive system. So it's hugely good that we have to talk with us tonight, Tim Harford, well known to many of you as the undercover economist from the Financial Times, presenter of Radio 4's More or Less, general all-purpose thinker about economics in a very interesting way, she says as a former student of economics. Um, Tim has written, get the plug in now Tim, a book called Adapt, which is, as you can now guess, hugely resonant with the things we at the Institute have been saying, but then need to regard policy making as more adaptive. So what we're going to do tonight is Tim is going to talk for a time between about 25 to 30 minutes, negotiating extra time, so we might get some instant feedback from the audience. Um, if it's only 15, then something's gone seriously wrong. Uh, John Van Rienen, who is head of the Centre for Economic Performance, the LSE, is then going to respond on behalf of, actually, what does this mean for the sort of more academic end of the community? And then there's clearly a crisis going on in behaviour change, because David Halpern, who is known to many of you as former research director of the Institute, uh, senior fellow of the Institute, but now head of the government's behavioural insights team, seems to have been detained with a behaviour in behavioural insight crisis. But hopefully David will join us. For those of you that think he's going to be commenting in ignorance, he has actually already read Tim's book and already last week shared an excellent session that Tim ran with members of the uh, strategy groups across governments. So David will not be commenting from complete ignorance. Um, so anyway, we're going to run that. About 45 minutes for that all told. Then we'll move straight into very active Q&A system, finish at 7.30, the usual IFG drinks. So without further ado, Tim Harford, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Joel. So um, this, this book started as a book about all the wonderful things economists could do to solve the world's most important problems, poverty, climate change, the financial crisis, innovation, uh, counter-terrorism, wars, all of that. Uh, and appropriately enough for a book that fundamentally came to be about trial and error, uh, I changed direction halfway through. I, it occurred to me that maybe economists actually didn't have the answers to many of these questions, and even if they did, it would make for a terribly boring book. And so, instead, I, I started drawing on what I was learning as I interviewed everyone from uh, serving officers in Iraq to scientists to poker players. Um, what I kept learning, uh, what kept coming out of all of these different problems, all of these different challenges, was that um, trial and error is tremendously important. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about that and what that may mean for government. But let me start by talking to you about a toaster. Uh, toast is, of course, an object close to my heart. I love toast. It's a very important thing. But a, the specific toaster that I want to talk to you about was constructed by a design student in London uh, called Thomas Thwaites. And he came up with this wonderful wheeze, which was co he called the Toaster Project. So the Toaster Project was to produce a toaster from scratch. The, the image you now need to imagine, and you'll find it hard to imagine, but once you've started, you'll find it very hard to stop, is of a design student, you know, just there in his underpants, Swiss Army knife, nothing else, trying to make a toaster. So where do you start? Well, one place that you could start is to buy a commercial toaster, take it apart and see where it works. So that's what he did. He bought a toaster from Argos. It costs £3.99. So less than one hour's labour will get you this toaster that's perfectly functional and looks beautiful and it works. Thwaites took apart the toaster and discovered that it has only over 400 components and subcomponents. That's more than one component per penny. It's quite impressive. Many different materials, copper, mica, which is a sort of slate-like material, you wrap the heating element around, iron, plastic. Plastic's very important. Without the plastic, it just doesn't look like a toaster. And then, of course, there's the electrocution to consider. So the plastic's important. This is, turns out to be a really rather complex object. 
So what, what did Thwaites then do? Well, he had to start by assembling his materials. Britain, it will not have escaped your notice, is a post-industrial society, so we don't actually have any iron mines left. But in his quest to get some iron, Thwaites called up a disused iron mine that's now a museum and said, look, I'm a design student, I'm trying to make a toaster. <laughs> he went down there, it turned out they'd misunderstood him on the phone, and actually they thought he was making a poster, not a toaster. <laughs> But that confusion was soon ironed out, and they gave him a suitcase full of iron ore. <laughs> now, of course, you all know how to turn iron ore into iron, right? Well, neither do I. <laughs> and he attempted to do this first with a gigantic dustpin with a, a leaf blower punched through the side, barbecue coals at the bottom. The leaf blower is blowing in this air. It's acting as bellows and trying to get really, really hot. And that didn't work. Then he discovered that there is a, a recently patented method of smelting iron in a microwave, which he did. Let's just, he actually did it in the second microwave. We, <laughs> we need not speak of the first microwave. Uh, now, but you're thinking to yourself, well, what about the purity of the original vision? Remember the Swiss Army knife? What's he doing with a microwave? What's he doing with a leaf blower? These are more complex, more expensive objects than the toaster itself. But, you know, he, he said, look, I... I had to make compromises, Tim. If it's just you, naked in a forest, you could spend your whole life trying to make a toaster. You're not going to get anywhere. So he, he made compromise after compromise. The plastic, for example. Where would you, where would you get plastic from? Nobody here, you know, uh, it's CP Snow, you know, the, the two cultures, right? It, oil, plastic comes from oil, people. <laughs> hey, just, just, you know, look it up. It's in a book. Um, now, where does oil come from? B BP. We've got loads of it. Spill it everywhere. So, <clears throat> so he called BP and said, look, I'll bring my own jug. Would you mind flying me out to an oil rig? I'll get some oil, and then I'll turn it into plastic. And that didn't happen. Uh, BP weren't too keen. So then he, he tried to create plastic from potato starch. That's possible, it turns out. But the plastic that results is, is edible. And so he lost it to hungry snails. In the end, he just, he just got some plastic and put it in a saucepan and melted it and you know, just scooped it up in a spatula and smeared it on his toaster. So he's making compromise after compromise after compromise. And the, the toaster that results, I don't know how best to describe it to you. Um, you know, when you're young, you, you ask your mother to make you a birthday cake in a special shape, like a birthday cake in the shape of a caterpillar a birthday cake in the shape of a chocolate fort or something like that. So imagine that you ask your mother to make you a birthday cake in the shape of a toaster. And imagine your mother was incredibly, incredibly drunk. <laughs> That's kind of what Thomas Thwaites' toaster looks like. It's this sort of lump in a vague toaster shape. It's got two holes in it. And it's just got congealed plastic smeared on the outside. And it just, it's not a pretty sight. And Thomas said to me, you know, Tim, it, it, if I plug it into a car battery, it does warm bread. But I am not sure what's going to happen when I plug it into the mains. And he eventually did that, and two seconds later, the toaster was toast. <laughs> now, why, why do I say this, tell you this story? Actually, I, I'm going to, let's take it further. So the toaster is complicated. What, what have we learned? The toaster's complicated. You can buy it for four pounds, but it's actually hard to make. How many products are there? like the toaster. How many products and services are there in, say, the, the, the London economy? In a hunter-gatherer society, the kind of society our brains evolved in, there are probably about 300 products. You know, this flint tax, that flint tax, you know, this bow and arrow, that loincloth, this hut, that pot, and there's just not a lot going on economically. 300 products. In Starbucks, does anyone want to go on? How many in Starbucks? Shout out. 500. Hands up if you think it's fewer than 500. Hands up if you think it's more than 500. OK, so the consensus here, this is a democratic institution, the institution of government, because this is more than 500. Anyone want to shout out a number higher than 500? Nobody. <laughs> well, you know, one of the themes of the book is it's, you know, failure really hurts. You know, it's embarrassing. <laughs> and uh, and that you know, people involved in government need to get a little bit 
were willing to take even small risks. Let's just sit down now. I kind of proved the whole point of the book. Okay, so there are 85,000 products on sale in Starbucks. And that's, they're kind of, Starbucks kind of, they're kind of cheating there because, you know, every different gloop and every different sort of, you know, soya kind of pr product creates a new, it's combinatorial, there's a new, it's multiplicative, there's a new range of products. So let's think about a big supermarket. In a big supermarket, there are probably 100,000 different products. In London, Eric Beinhock, a smart guy at the McKinsey Global Institute, he's been trying to figure this out. And of course, we don't really know. Eric Beinhocker reckons that in the economy of London, if you think of all the different products and services on offer, and you imagine going past a cash register and you're registering them all, so you need a different barcode for each one that is in any way uh, you know, worth distinguishing. How many different products and services in the London economy? Approximately 10 billion. And then think about the toaster. And think about what that implies for the complexity of the economy that we've created, and by extension, the complexity of the society that is completely intertwined with that economy. It's incredibly complex. We don't understand it. It's highly decentralized. And if I were the Tim Harford of five years ago, well, if I were the Tim Harford of five years ago, I wouldn't be referring to myself in the third person. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would write about the toaster, and then I'd say, Wow, the market is amazing. You can get this toaster for less than an hour's work. No one understands where it comes from. Nobody, there's nobody in charge of the toaster. It just happens. It's just a miracle. And you know, that's a sort of creation myth in, in economics. You know, that is true. I mean, it, it is kind of amazing that we have all these products, that the teams that produce them are so decentralized, that the, the miner in the Chiquicamata mine in Chile who drives one of these gigantic trucks lo loaded with copper ore, he doesn't know whether the copper ore is going to go to make copper that is going to go into a toaster or into the casing of a bullet. He has no idea. He doesn't need to know the system still works. So I could stop there and go, wow, you know, markets are cool. But what I've noticed over the last few years, and some of you may have noticed the same thing, is it turns out the world's not perfect. And the market doesn't solve every problem. Um, we have a lot of issues to deal with. We've got climate change. We've got, I think, a, there's a very good case that there's an innovation slowdown uh, going on. Even if there isn't an innovation slowdown going on, you know, where's my jetpack? Where's the HIV virus? You know, where, where's, where's nuclear fusion? I mean, there's a lot of innovation that we were hoping for that hasn't happened. Um, there are wars. Uh, there are efforts to fight terrorism. There are very, very poor countries. I mean, there are a lot of problems in the world. And I now see the toaster not as a symbol of how cool the market is, although, of course, it is still that, but as a symbol of the challenges that lie in wait for anybody who wants to solve problems, anyone who wants to make policy in a complex system. If you just look at Thomas Thwaites and the trouble he had making this toaster, you think about the incredible complexity of the system that produces this toaster, and you say to yourself, I want to make the world a better place. I want to make this system work better. I want to do something about climate change. I want to do something about poverty. I want to do something about social exclusion. And the toaster is a symbol of the hurdles that you're facing when you want to do that. So, I mean, what we might look at at this point is how, does, you know, how do problems get solved? If, if it's so complicated, if it's so hard to understand, if experts are so helpless in the face of this, and I haven't got time, but I, I could rant on for ages about the difficulties experts have in solving these complex problems. How do problems get solved at all? So, um, I mean, one, one thing you could look at is, is the market. The market is not perfect, the market doesn't solve all problems, but it has, it has really nailed you know, the, the toaster-style problems, material affluence problems in the Western world. You know, we've basically got what we want. We've got cars, we've got suits, we've got place to sleep, we've got enough food. That's, that's been nailed, that problem. And let's not underestimate that. It's an incredibly difficult problem. It's defeated all kinds of civili civilizations since civilization existed. So let's not just shrug our shoulders and ignore how that problem was solved. So how was it solved? I would argue it was solved through a process of trial and error. There are many, many different pieces of evidence that I could call uh, to support me here. And I haven't got time to refer to all the pieces of evidence. But let me just tell you about one. And it's a book called In Search of Excellence. 
And this was one of the most, the best selling business books of all time by Tom Peters and Robert Waterman. And In Search of Excellence, published in 1982, went through um, 43 excellent American companies. They sort of selected these companies because they were so excellent. And then they could talk about these excellent companies and their R&D policies, their finance policies, their governance, um, their recruitment, you know, everything about their management style. And you could read In Search of Excellence, and then you too could learn to be excellent, like the excellent companies In Search of Excellence was written about. Fine. Very, basically the template for all future business books. Fine. Two years later, Business Week had a cover story. Just imagine the cover of Business Week. Oops. Who's excellent now? Because nearly one third of those companies were in severe financial trouble. You know, it turns out, you know, whatever, you know, if excellence was what Tom Peters found when he looked at Wang and Atari and Pan Am and these kind of companies, if that's, <laughs> if that's what he found, which, and let's face it, that's what a lot of people found when they looked at those companies, then it was a fleeting quality. So maybe they were never excellent. I think more likely, well, they were excellent at what they did for a while, and it didn't last because the world is a complex place, because the world moves on. 10% of American businesses disappear every year. They're, they're bought up or they go bankrupt. That is the failure rate in this successful economy, 10% of American businesses. The, um, there is evidence from uh, Randall Mork and others that turnover, increased rates of corporate failure are actually positively related to economic growth and it's future facing. So if you have a high rate of corporate turnover today, that's, it looks like a good record, good prospects for economic growth over the next decade or so. There's, there's quite a close relationship, a pretty, or at least a plausible relationship, between failure on the individual level, the business level, the project level, if you like, and success for the overall economy. And that sort of makes sense. Because what could the process of economic growth be other than ideas failing, being shunted to one side, and being replaced with something better? A better use for the capital, a better use for the labor, just a, a better use for the space, better use for the natural resources. It's this process of trial and error, of uh, for failures being weeded out and being replaced by successes. It's a selection mechanism, and it's tremendously powerful. It's not the only such selection mechanism. Uh, I am no longer a market fundamentalist. You know, the, the scientific method is a selection mechanism. We get rid of the failures, we replace them. We get rid of bad ideas, we replace them with better ideas. Biology, ecosystems, offer a selection mechanism. You know, we all know how that worked out. You know, here we all are. It's a very, very powerful process. But if the process is so powerful, why is it that in government we find trial and error so hard to manage? What, what are the challenges and how can we surmount those challenges and experiment more? How can we make government institutions more experimental, more willing to try new things, more willing to fail, and sharper at identifying the failures and getting rid of them. I talk in the book about a guy called Peter Palchinsky. You don't need to know who he is. He's the engineer who told Stalin he was wrong. Okay, so you can guess what happened to him. But the life of Peter Palchinsky, sort of, he, in criticizing Stalin-esque engineering projects, he basically developed three principles for failing productively. So one is you need to try a lot of things. Remember, 10% of American businesses go bankrupt every year. You know, the, there's a, the failure rate is going to be quite high. So therefore, you need lots of variation, lots of different things. Pluralism. The second thing is those failures have got to be survivable. Silicon Valley, they talk about fail faster, double your failure rate. Wall Street, they talk about too big to fail. You know, ask yourself which section of the American economy has contributed more to welfare over the last 20 years. You, know? this, you need to be willing to fail, and for those failures, not to be too big, those failures to be survivable. So point number one, lots of potential failures, lots of experiments. Point number two, survivable experiments. They've got to, you know, they've got to be not everything at once. Now point number three is perhaps the most challenging, I think, for governments. It's distinguishing the difference between what's working and what's not. This is something we all have problems with. I write in the book about the psychological barriers to identifying that you personally have made a mistake, the denial, the loss chasing, the, if you want to borrow a, a term from behavioral economics, the hedonic editing. We're amazingly good at convincing ourselves that, yeah, it, it might look to other people as though what we did completely sucked, but actually it was great. It was a triumph. And if, we, if we're good at doing that 
as individuals, we're fantastic at doing that as institutions, as hierarchical institutions. You know, we, we know how quick bad news is to travel up the organization. You know, we know how rapidly honest feedback reaches the top. And the answer is not very rapid. <laughs> it's not really in anyone's interests to provide that feedback. So we need better feedback mechanisms. There are a number of ways that you know, we can provide them. There's formal experimentation. There's formal, uh, formal data gathering and data analysis. And I'm a big fan of this. This works well. So just to tell you how big a fan I am, you know, I, um, I was born in 1973. Like, I know it's hard to believe, <laughs> young, I'm nearly 40. I was born in 1973. Like most babies born in 1973, my parents put me to sleep on my stomach because the advice was from Benjamin Spock, and not the guy with the ears, the other Spock. The advice was, put your children to sleep like that. If they vomit in the night, they'll, they'll vomit onto the sheets, and they won't choke on the vomit, and they're less likely to suffer cot death. So it's, it's kind of an important piece of advice. Now, Spock wasn't alone. There were lots of pediatricians advising this in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Turns out the evidence for it was pretty much non-existent. No one really knew. It was just a sort of theory. But, you know, fair enough. I, whenever I talk to people in government, they say, well, often we don't have the evidence and we have to work on a theory. Well, okay, fine. So work on a theory. He worked on a theory. He gave his advice. Fine. Slowly but surely, it became clear that that actually is not the way to prevent cot death. Although the risks are small either way, the risks of cot death are about three times higher, which is non-trivial if you put your baby to sleep on their front. You need to put them to sleep on the back. Okay, now people often say, well, you know, all these randomized trials that people keep advocating now in policy, these randomized trials, they only ever solve small problems. They're only ever like tiny, tiny little problems, like, you know, baby front, baby back, little problems. They never solve the big, interesting problems. And, you know, that's true. I mean, there's a recent epidemiological study reckoned that the delay in figuring that out and telling everybody only killed 60,000 babies. So, you know, I'm, you know, I'm sympathetic to people who say that randomized trials don't, don't fix big problems, they only ever solve small problems. But actually, although randomized trials have got really big in medicine, and although, you know, we can use them in social policy, we can use them in, uh, in uh, penal policy, we can use them in healthcare, um, actually, the discovery of front sleeping versus back sleeping it actually didn't come from a clinical trial, it just came from a very, very rigorous gathering together of evidence by the Cochrane Collaboration, which is a network of doctors who just pull together all the evidence they, they can find, have rigorous trial registers, sum it all up, and it was one 12 baby study and one 14 baby study and one eight baby study, and was it study after study after study that individually meant absolutely nothing and collectively meant everything. So it doesn't have to be a randomized trial, it's just a respect for the data and not just sort of saying, well, you know, we can't find the data, but actively going out, gathering every study you can, putting it together in a systematic way, that saves lives. And if the evidence is on education, that improves education. If the evidence is on recidivism, that reduces reoffending. I mean, the, take, respecting evidence is tremendously, tremendously important. Um, of course, medicine in dealing with randomized trials, they've, you know, reached a lot of resistance. So Archie Cochrane, who is this wonderful Scottish, Scottish epidemiologist who um, really revolutionized the way doctors thought about evidence-based medicine, um, the guy whom the Cochrane collaboration was named after, he used, to, um, he used to complain about the God complex in his colleagues. So they, they knew the answer already. Now, I tell you this only out of interest because I know it doesn't exist in politics, but still. Mm -hmm. um, so the God complex, you know the answer. So in one, in one case, Archie Cochrane ran a randomized trial to see whether people recovered better in cardiac wings or at home after sort of cardiac incidents. And he was told it was incredibly unethical to run this trial. He was killing people. And he got together all the doctors in charge of all these cardiac wings, and he said, well, we have some preliminary evidence now. It's not statistically significant, but I thought you should know. It appears that recuperating at home is dangerous. The death rates among patients are higher in patients who recuperate at home. And all his colleagues, who were incredibly sure of themselves, banged on the table and said, "This is. We always knew you were unethical, Archie. You just. You, you should. We should stop this trial at once. You're killing people. We always told you our our cardiac wards were more effective, and you know you should never have even started this trial." <laughs> 
Cochrane then said, oh, it's interesting, because I, actually I just swapped the two columns on the table I gave you. It turns out your cardiac wards seem to be killing people, and recuperating at home seems to be safer. But, you know, I mean, you know, I wanted to continue the trial, because it's not statistically significant yet. We haven't got final results, but do you want to stop now for ethical reasons? And sort of <laughs> tumbleweed then rolled through the room. <laughs> he, he, he understood that even, you know, even if you pretty confident in yourself, it's always worth trying to gather more evidence. So that's the formal evidence. But informal evidence, informal feedback is also extremely important. And I, I just want to speak briefly about this, um, because I, I know, you know I promise not to speak for too long. Um, so one of the things that I saw again and again, only one chapter in the book is about r randomized trials. One of the things I saw again and again, whether I was looking at the US Army in Iraq, or whether I was looking at corporate strategies, um, or whether I was looking at trying to prevent financial meltdowns, is the importance of appropriate decentralization. When you decentralize an organization, you've got people who are there on the ground who see what's happening. Hayek called it knowledge of the specific circumstances of time and place. H.R. McMaster, who is a colonel in Iraq, who I think more than anybody else was responsible for saving the US Army for, from itself, H.R. McMaster, who's a hero of the book, argued against the idea that you could deliver situational analysis on a computer screen. There's this idea the US Army had, you can fight a war based on centralizing all the information, put it all together, huge databases, Donald Rumsfeld sits there, white cat, loads and loads of screens, <laughs> stroking the cat, moving everything around, he can see everything. H.R. McMaster had been in a tank battle where he nearly got killed because that centralized system of knowledge broke down and he had to make split second decision. It was the correct decision. He saved every single one of his men because he made the right decision. And from that point, he spent his career campaigning for better training of men on the ground, more decentralization of responsibility. Another example from the war in Iraq, uh, Major John Nagel, who's a counterinsurgency expert I interviewed for the book. He said, look, when I was in Baghdad, I was 30 years old, I was a major, and I had a PhD in counterinsurgency from Oxford University. I had guys under me who were 18-year-old kids, no formal qualifications. They had the authority to kill people. I did not have the authority to create a pamphlet to engage in a propaganda war with the local insurgents. So there's this real mismatch in delegation. The senior ranks of the US Army absolutely unwilling to delegate to the middle managers who really see the situation on the ground and could respond. So decentralization can be very, very important. I, mean, I could give you many, many examples, but Jill would throw something at me. Um, but a, a, a warning, a warning about decentralization, because I know it's all the rage here. Again and again, looking at the book, you, looking at the cases in the book, You've got to get the incentives right when you decentralize. You've got to be monitoring the people on the ground in some meaningful way. One of the things that worked incredibly well uh, in many cases is peer monitoring. So in Iraq, the reason H.R. McMaster's ideas caught on was not because anybody at the top of the US Army was paying any attention to them. They weren't. They were turning him, out, turning, uh, him uh, down for promotion. They were turning him down for reinforcements. They were telling him to mind his own business. It was because his peers saw what he was doing worked. They could see the results for themselves, and they started copying those ideas and replicating those ideas elsewhere. And peer monitoring is also used anywhere from Timpson, the key cutting chain, to Google in different ways. A lot of these organizations, the US Army is not one of them, but a lot of these organizations which decentralize, decentralize paying very close attention to incentives. It's not just a case of saying, well, OK, you guys are there, you guys run it. You also have to ask yourself, have you guys got the knowledge to run it? Have you guys got the right incentives to run it? Is anybody there making sure that you're doing a good job? So while I'm very sympathetic with a, an agenda of decentralization, because it creates more pluralism, because it creates more, uh, more um, experiments, we also have somebody has to decide whether those experiments are working or not. And incentives really matter. 45 seconds, and then I'll stop. seconds. Then I'll stop, OK? That's a lie. I mean 90 seconds. She won't notice. Right. When I've been to... <laughs> oh, did I say that out loud? <laughs> when, I, when, I've been to, when I've been talking... <laughs> when I've been talking to policymakers, and I've been talking to policymakers um, for months, and probably for years, actually, while working on this book, I, I, I do hear 
the same sort of complaints about the risks involved in experimentation. They say, look, it takes too long to gather the evidence. There is a cultural risk aversion. What if you prove it doesn't work? Uh, you know, what if the what if the knowledge what if the not well, which you will about half the time half the time it doesn't work and that's tremendously valuable knowledge that it doesn't work. So I, I, I get a lot of objections to this and, and people say well you know this is extremely difficult this is a really tough agenda, and I say well okay that's that's fine I respect that. But then I think about Archie Cochrane that Scottish epidemiologist. At one stage he was in a prisoner of war camp in World War II and he was dying. And the other prisoners in the camp were also dying. Cochrane was the camp doctor, and he didn't know what was killing them. He didn't know what the problem was. He thought to himself, what can I do? I've got no theory. I'm a useless doctor. The Germans are shooting into the camp for fun. At one stage, a German threw a grenade into the latrine block, you know, because he heard suspicious laughter. Archie Cochrane was one of the guys who had to go in and, and clear it up. I mean, he was in a completely helpless situation. What did he do? He said, I've got to, run a, got to run a trial. He smuggled in vitamin C, and he bought on the black market Marmite, which contains vitamin B12. And in the hospital barracks, he ran this randomized trial where half the guys got Marmite and half the guys got vitamin C. And when you read his autobiography, he is beating himself up constantly about this because he doesn't have a proper theory, and he doesn't have proper randomization. And that, but, but he, he got it, he understood how important this thing was. And after four days, he had the results, and it was absolutely clear. It was the Marmite, it was B12 that these men needed. He went to the camp guards. You've got to imagine a sort of version of Billy Connolly. I mean, he's Scottish, he's got long hair, he's got a long ginger beard. He's ranting in perfect German with a Scottish accent. And so this is the land of Goethe and Schiller. It's unacceptable that this is going on. And he shows them the graph. And then he, he gives up. He leaves, he goes back to his room, and he breaks down in tears, because he's sure they're all going to die there, because the situation is completely hopeless. And one German doctor, a young German doctor, picks up the graph and says to his colleagues, look at that. That evidence is incontrovertible. If we don't supply vitamins to these men, this is a war crime. The next day, the vitamins arrived, and they all recovered. So Archie Cochran knew that gathering evidence and experimenting was not just a case of figuring out what worked. It was also an essential part of the case of establishing a, the justification for acting, making the rhetorical case, as well as the intellectual case, that a particular policy, a particular way forward, actually works. And he did it in the most impossible circumstances. So if he can do it, we can do it. Thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm very, very happy to uh, talk about Tim's book, which uh, I, I think is great and um, <laughs> available from all good publishers. I, I must say, I actually bought my own copy, you see, so you, there is some benefit to uh, making me speak tonight. And uh, the copy had Tim's signature on it in the Economist bookshop by the LSE and actually sold at a quite a substantial discount from the normal unsigned copy. So I'm not quite sure what that says about the value of Tim's uh, imprimatur, but uh, nevertheless, I, I recommend it. Let's, so, I mean, the book, there was a really deep truth in what Tim's saying here. And I, I, you know, the, the idea of having a system um, whereby that system can be successful, where there is a situation where there is a variety of ideas, a variety of trials, and then the successful trials, successful ideas are selected out, is really one of the most fundamental principles across a whole range of areas. And we know that very well from evolution. There's got a theory of evolution is behind that. Um, it's also true of economies, as, as Tim described. It's also true of science. So in terms of uh, you know, my, you know, economics, if it could be called a science, or other disciplines, that is exactly how sciences work. I mean, there's all these crazy ideas coming around. And then there's a process of a, you know, the kind of academic of a bun fight of people throwing things at each other. And out of that, the, the best ideas emerge and prosper and go forward. And that really is how, how you know, more or less how things, things kind of work. Um, in economies, people often don't realize this because um, we often think of economic growth as the process of the adoption of ideas spreading around the world. In fact, a lot of the process of successful economies is enabling more efficient firms and more productive firms to get larger. It's not just the creation of a new idea, it's the selection of the better ideas and the imitation of those better ideas. There's a recent study, um, for example, if you think about 
uh, say, China or India in the United States, we often think that um, the reason that, say, China or India are so much poorer than the US is because the US has access to much better technologies. In fact, about 50% of the productivity difference between, say, India and, and the US is to do with the way that output is misallocated in India. There's a lot of very inefficient firms who in the US will never survive, which uh, in India are, are protected and prosper, and a lot of more efficient firms which are, you know, are not allowed to grow to the size that they should grow due to a whole range of different things, a mixture of uh, economic regulations and cultural forces prevent, preventing growth. So that reallocation uh, mechanisms is actually fundamental to the success of, success of uh, societies and economies. So I'm, you know, I'm very much of a supporter of Tim's view. And I, I've been, you know, my, my crusade for many years has been trying to get governments to take seriously the importance of evidence, to have in the mantra evidence-based policy, to take data seriously, to take results seriously. And I have to say, you know, I, I think generally that has, has, been, has failed. I mean, I, I feel I, um, you know, that has been relatively unsuccessful. And the, you know, or, the mantra of evidence-based policy actually is, is typically more like policy-based evidence. And a minister will have a policy and then select the appropriate bit of evidence which will back that up regardless of the quality of the underlying evidence. And, you know, I, I think that it's, there's, a, there's a real fundamental problem. Now, it's not all bad news. So there, are, there are some positive examples. But recently, um, if you look at many of the policies which have uh, been ditched, for example, the educational maintenance allowance. That's one of the few policies which was subject to a high quality evaluation. This is a policy which effectively gave uh, subsidies to kids from low income families to encourage them to start at school. There was a, a series of evaluations, one particularly good one by my rival institute, the Institute of Fiscal Studies, which showed that this was actually quite an effective policy. And you know, the abolition of that policy was basically, you know, the evidence was just more or less ignored in the decision to, to abolish it. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, you know, there's going to be a, a, a speech tomorrow by the Prime Minister on healthcare reform. And if you think about the sad history of the last, e of the last year or so in terms of the, uh, the, bit, the NHS and social care bill, um, a huge reform, one of the biggest reforms the National Health Service, being decided on the basis of hardly evidence. And not just that, with hardly any um, notion that we should put uh, systems in place to evaluate whether this is going to work or not. Um, so, you know, really, and, and you know, this is not a political point. I mean, it, another example would be um, the so-called train to gain policy, which is a policy for adult, adult literacy at work, which the last government supported. Um, another, there was a good um, evaluation of that, showing that unfortunately this policy wasn't successful in raising productivity. Um, the, uh, that evaluation was looked at by the minister and was um, uh, put out in the public domain. Uh, on Boxing Day. So you can imagine what effect uh, that had to the, the evaluation. So, you know, it raises the question, well, why, you know, <laughs> why should the evolutionary approach that Tim's suggesting succeed? I mean, it should succeed. I mean, it's common sense. We live in a relatively post-ideological world. Um, you know, we don't have such class-based politics. There's a huge benefit to politicians if they can deliver reforms which work, which actually do some good, like improve public services. There's a huge pool of people that you can draw on to do evaluations. Academics who, uh, you know, as Mrs. Thatcher said, are prepared to usually work for Bach. Um, the, the great thing is we have data, we have uh, techniques to do evaluations, and the, you can, if you, as long as you give, feed these, uh, these people data and they'll go out and do your evaluations for you for nothing because their incentives are coming to publish in journals and they'll be very happy to be involved in doing these evaluations. So there's a very cheap pool of labor which can be, uh, which can be used. Um, economics, as Tim has said in many of his articles, has, has itself evolved. It used to be the case, I know when I was studying, there were all the prizes and the esteem went to great theories, you know, philosophical uh, musings of uh, general equilibrium theory. Today, the prizes of the profession go to people like Steve Levitt, whose um, you know, free economics idea is actually to try and answer interesting questions using new data and using new experiments. And really, the, pri you know, the, the, kind of the dynamic of modern economics really is very empirically based around experimentation, much less than it is in, in doing grand theories. So you know, th there's, there's a huge reason why this evolutionary approach should succeed. Um, there are some positive things. There's more piloting national, than, than, than before national rights than we used to have. There is some clinical trials. But in general, you know, it hasn't, this, 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 this uh, attempt we're doing to have more evidence-based policy hasn't been successful. So what is the problem? And Tim's book addresses this. 
There's a lot of problems which people say, which I don't really think stand up to scrutiny. So um, you could say, well, oh, policy makings are so much more complex and all these other things we've been talking about, it's too difficult. You know, there's a lot <laughs> human, humanity, you know, human life is quite complex. There's a lot of very complex questions. I think policy making is not so much more complex than other things. It takes too long. Well, as, as Tim said, you know, it can be done sometimes in four days. The data is too poor. Well, you know, we've come, we now have um, a revolution in information technology, which en enables us to collect and analyze data at speeds we've never been able to do before. Um, we, uh, we have too much data rather than too little data. Um, the tools have massively improved. Results are never clear. Well, yes, I mean, sometimes you get a negative result, which is very important. Um, often, the findings that you have from doing uh, uh, you know, randomized control trials or other forms of evidence is not simply that the policy doesn't work. It's, uh, you know, even if you find a policy doesn't work on average, you might find it actually does work for certain groups of the population. Uh, for example, one of the most famous um, social experiments was the Perry Preschool Experiment, which was an educational intervention to help low-income families in the United States. Um, that was incredibly successful, but it worked much better for some groups than others. So, for example, for boys, it led to a huge reduction in crime rates, which meant the policy paid for itself, but didn't have a very big effect on their education rates. So you'd say, well, in terms of their education rates, it wasn't very successful. But in terms of other outcomes like crime, it was extremely successful. So usually with you know, ev types of evidence, you, you can actually find things, um, even, even if the overall policy isn't successful, it might be successful for subgroups. You know, another excuse is like being expensive. You know, it's too expensive to run an evaluation. Well, you know, what about a policy which is going to transfer tens of billions of pounds to uh, GPs, for example? Are we going to do that without evaluating the outcome of that. It seems like a rather expensive policy for a failure when uh, you know, a, a very small amount of money could be spent on trying to evaluate whether it works or not. So I think the real reasons why the, the problems is much more to do with the psychological things that Tim points. We don't like politicians, other people don't like to admit failure. The time horizon of politicians is rel relatively short. Um, the, uh, we have in society, in, in the public and the media, we don't like the admission of uncertainty. I think the problem really is, in some sense, with us and with society, that you know, we like to have leaders who know what to do, who say they know what to do, and produce a plan. Whereas, in fact, you know, the leaders are like us. They don't really know what to do. And it's much better to admit that and be much more tolerant of failure than, 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 than we are. So that, that, you know, that needs some type of a, a kind of cultural change, not just amongst the politicians, but also amongst the media and the population in general. Um, so what can be done? Uh, I guess there's two things I think which can be done. One is education. So I think having things like Tim's book, uh, having um, training in doing evaluations and quantitative techniques, that, all those things are very good um, and very useful. But I think there's other things which can be done as well. I mean, I, I, I would say that w what we need, and this is maybe it, a popular suggestion is we need to create institutions and agencies which are robust to political interference. So we need to actually say that there are many um, areas of policies where we need to set up agencies and institutions which are going to look at the evidence and be able to put in place different policies which uh, may be politically unpopular um, but are somehow protected from the uh, the day-to-day -day fighting in the political world. Now, you might think that's complete naive, but we do that all the time. I mean, uh, you know, in terms of clinical trials, um, the most clinical trials we do are for drug introduction, and we seem to be perfectly happy to accept the results of clinical trials and therefore recommend drugs or not to be used on the basis of that. NICE, I think, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, is one of the great innovations set up over the last 10 or 15 years. And more widely than um, particular drugs, it's now being used to um, look at the evidence and also make recommendations for a variety of different interventions. Uh, Peter Orzak, who some of you might know, um, was one of the main players behind US healthcare reform, gave a talk a couple of weeks ago. And he stressed that one of the things which may um, be most important about US healthcare is uh, something with a rather uh, na a name called an iPad. Like a, a kind of, it sounds like an iPod, uh, but actually may deliver more benefits than the iPod. It's the in Independent Payment Advisory Board. And this is the institution set up. It's going to be an agency in the US, and it's going to be able to look at a series of medical interventions and managerial interventions in clinical care to reduce costs. 
and it's allowed to run pilots, and if those pilots are successful, it can roll out, it can recommend those are adopted, and this might be anything from value-based pricing in, of drugs to uh, price caps of medical device and so on. And the important thing about the IPAB is that in order for its uh, rulings, its judgments, to be changed by politicians, it requires a vote in the House of Representatives and in the Senate. And then the president can still sort of veto that, and then you'd need a supermajority in Congress. So what does that mean? It means it's actually very difficult for Congress to be, for members of Congress to be lobbied by players in the, in the medical industry or the pharmaceutical industry and overcome this recommendation from the agency. So, and it also exploits kind of inertia as well, because in order to overturn something, it's much harder than to stop thing, something happening. So I think this is an example of the types of um, ways which evidence-based policy can be used. And it requires a certain political robustness. So you might say it's anti-democratic or undemocratic. In some sense, it is. But it's uh, a way of setting up institutions to try and deal with this problem that politicians face of uh, incredible pressure not to admit failure. So you know, I hope we open that up for discussion. Um, and I'll leave the floor to everybody else. OK, brilliant.